Now, I don't know what JT, a.k.a. Alexis, thought she was getting into when she argued with Mr. Mr. LaRon, honey, he gives Saucy Santana energy and he was ready to give it back to you, ma'am. Was that Kubrick Zuckonian? <laughs> Y'all, let's get into the Ricky Lake of it all in terms of the energy that this reunion was given part one of Ready to Love Dallas. y'all it's your girl Tammy and I know I'm a little bit late honey but you know I was never gonna let y'all slip or let this slip question crew we are back for the season part one finale of ready to love um as we can see obviously they still have decided that they're gonna get all their furniture from the room store <laughs> why well, I look like Will 1.0 aka Big Willie aka Willie that might be a scammer stage the stage <laughs> I don't know what's going on with the furniture is giving. I just went to the Goodwill along with some old bar signs that probably could have been at the back of an alley somewhere. I just really need them to work on stage setting. It doesn't make any sense at this point on. It's just at this point it's getting disrespectful, but at the end of the day, honey, the day got to end. So let's get into these outfits. Now, you know, I'm going to always do me and always be me. Of course we get this full scan around the room where everybody got on. So let's get into the outfits, honey, because it was cute, but it was also very questionable. You know, at, let's start at the top, honey. Maya, I do not know what happened, dear. Maya has dressed so cute the entire season. And y'all know y'all have stuck with me the entire way. And I have given every lady their props on this show for the most part that has dressed consistently. Dallas-Fort Worth has really shown out and reset the clock on messy outfits going henceforth. But the reunion, the ladies really kind of let me down. I wasn't as energized about what they had on. You know, Maya's always pretty. Hair was great. Makeup was great. But this dress simply was not it. And I feel like a lot of times what ends up happening with clothes, especially for the reunion type situation, is people think about how the dress looks when they're standing up, but not when they're sitting down. And because so much of the film, um, of the filming of the show and the reunion is them sitting down in chairs, whether they be on the couch or whether they be on stools, I think it's so important that whenever you think about what you're going to wear, how it's going to look when you're sitting on the couch in front of the camera. So you want to make sure that your thighs, your legs and stuff is looking good and that your slit ain't too high. Um, and then you want to make sure that when you're sitting up that you're also presenting really well. So I just really hated this cut on her. It looked uncomfortable. I feel like it didn't highlight the best parts of her body and I just wasn't feeling it. Jonathan, Mr. Pink, he looked great. It looked fantastic. It, it gave, you know... I went to the mall and got a suit, but it was a nice suit and it looked good on him and it complimented him very well. Dominic, another one, also knocked it out the park. I thought he looked very nice. They both like they're going to a formal event. It was very clear that they understood their sizing and what a jacket should look like as a grown man with a bow tie. Uh, so I appreciated that. Next up, I forgot old girl name. I think her name is Tiffany, Tiffany, whatever. I didn't care for the dress. Much like the very first episode, I was unimpressed. Um, and I hated that this was the color I think she got eliminated in. So I don't really know what was going on with that blue, but it was boring. I felt like the wig was boring. I feel like, look, if y'all gonna eliminate me on the first round, I'm gonna make sure when I show back up, y'all gonna remember why y'all missed me. Um, Will 1.0 looked like a jackass. Uh, he looked like a reject from a shaft, like a shaft <laughs> movie. I don't know what was going on. I, who is dressing this? I don't understand. The medallion with the turtleneck at the top. It just looked weird. Um, he already looks weird to me anyway, but it already looked weird when he had on. I did not understand it. And why is he still wearing that chain? Leilin, who is beautiful and was smart enough to eliminate herself early on. I was just disappointed with Leilin's outfit. What y'all feeling about it? I don't like the origami arms. Again, I feel like because she's sitting seated, while this may have looked good standing up when sitting down, I just wasn't feeling the outfit. It just wasn't giving what it was supposed to give. And I also didn't feel like I loved the hair that much. I'm glad it was pulled back because the dress is doing so much that you don't want to make such a big fuss about the hair, but it was kind of boring to me. Hmm. Next up on the couch, we got Mika, who I think maybe did okay with the dress. It was different for her, but honestly, I didn't think it did much. I thought the dress was really, you know, panned down from a more vibrant color that I think would have looked great on camera. I don't know if they were trying to let them set the mood or what they were going to do. I hated the blonde wig. It looked bad. It was frizzy. Um, again, these people are taping for multiple hours in a day. So I'm just thinking like, hey, are y'all thinking about hairspray, touch-ups, all that kind of stuff? I feel like it just didn't compliment her. And she's such a beautiful girl. And I feel like, you know, didn't have to keep the black hair, but maybe just something different. Honey, maybe we should have gone to Rashina for the hairstyle. Next up is Justin. I thought he looked okay. 
I think he complimented himself with the shirt he had on and his like his frame. The suit looked good. Um, the cornrows were neat and nice, so I appreciated that as well. Justin showed through. It was pretty nice. Loved uh, what Koshia had on. The dress complimented her body. It looked really good. Um, it looked grown. I adored this. Um, and I just hated that her hair was the same that had been on the show. Was anybody else annoyed by that? It just felt like she left that show that day and then came back the next day to do this. I would have loved her to do something different with her hair because we had constantly seen it in a ponytail throughout the entire season before she left. So I just thought it was kind of boring to keep it in that same fashion. And it did not complement the dress, which was really, really beautiful. Uh, Lamar looks like anybody angry from the post office. So um, he looked like, it looked tight. It did look comfortable. He looks uptight and not comfortable. And um, his ankles was ashy. Let's move on. Now, on the left side of town, on the other side of Tommy, I was a little bit more um, underwhelmed. <laughs> y'all thought I was going to say impressed, but y'all wasn't even impressed. Um, let's get to it. Let's do the top again. I feel like I really loved Vanessa's look. I thought the hair complimented the earrings. The dress complimented her skin. Vanessa really understands her body. And I think it shows in a lot of the things that she tended to wear on this show. Quite a few of the women at least did initially, but I feel like... They just fumbled the bag on this one when it came to the outfits. But I do love the diversity in look. Um, and at least the gowns felt appropriate for the event. I will say, like, in the past, we didn't have a lot of feathers this season. We didn't have a lot of ridiculous high, high slits that made no sense. It was nice to see them kind of understand the moment to a certain degree. Um, Chad looks like he, you know, came from the thrift store. Bin. Who is dressing this man? It, it, it's it's got to be him. I pray it is because it can't be a stylist or any help. And it further deduces why it was important that Vanessa chose herself. This was going to be your reality. Um, I believe he had on a polo shirt, but it could have also been a, a, a dress shirt. I can't really tell because of the collar. Um, I believe that was a vest that might have belonged to a suit from a doorman's outfit. I don't know what we were doing right here. I know y'all saw that Luther Vandross blazer from the 80s that he had over it with a pair of white pants. It's clear that Chaz does not care. So why should we? April looked fantastic, honey. I was just so happy she got rid of that honey blonde and that brown wig. I mean, well, that brown pack of hair. <laughs> Look, I'm here for a good set of pack of some hair store hair, but it was very evident. And I was also happy that somebody showed her what a closure looks like. Um, because she did not know that during the season. The dress complimented her skin um, and the color was beautiful on her. The length complimented her. She looked really beautiful. Black is really a great color on her hair. So I was just happy to see that. Uh, Will looks like he's dressed like one of the OJs um, after the show. He didn't even look like he was dressed for the stage. Um, Rashina, I loved the look in the front. Like I loved it, but again, the back just looked a little bit messy to me when they were backstage. And for her to be a hairdresser, I was a little bit disappointed in that because I wanted her hair to look like set A1 when you were like, mm. I love the updo for the look because obviously she had like a, a pretty much closed neck for the most part. It was, you know, given turtleneck length in terms of the, the top part. So it really made no sense for her to have her hair down. It made sense in theory. I just wish the hair didn't look so messy from the beginning. Um, fashion dude, I can't remember his name, Demonte Delamonte. Um, you know, it was different. Different good, different bad is your choice. Uh, down below, you know, again, I don't understand the outfit on Alexis. Alexis doesn't understand the outfit on Alexis. <laughs> it was very much giving Barbie's cousin Skipper the black edition, and I did not understand it at all. It gave Junior prom. Um, I feel like she constantly diminishes her um, style to something very young and I don't mean you know she's on she's in her early 30s but she dresses like a teen to me and I do not understand that to be taken seriously and obviously we'll talk about that a little bit more Laron looked like somebody's sweaty preacher <laughs> he definitely looked like somebody had been backslided <laughs> at 54th Baptist <laughs> it's like he didn't even care he literally left the house like this is gonna work and it did not and then you know, we moved on to Krishan Jr. I'm not, I'm sorry, Krishan Sr., a.k.a. Patrice. I liked Patrice's dress, actually. I just didn't love the extra added pieces. Like, I really didn't love the tattoo. I get the henna part. I just think it 
I think it worked against her in this capacity because I feel like with the henna, because she already has a tattoo sleeve and a tattoo um, on her right side or her left side, I guess she has her arm kind of lengthy with tattoos. I feel like the henna kind of did not, it didn't clash with the dress because it was red on red, but it just, it, it did too much. And then she already has like the design of her hair. Patrice is definitely a unique individual, but I think sometimes too much of the, the tattoos, too much of the henna, too much of the extra takes away from the beauty of a dress. And honestly, when your dress is really well made and really well done, you have to have just like some really cute accessories and decent makeup and it sets itself off. But I feel like the more you do to the look, the more you add on, it just, it takes away from it and it distracts from what the beauty is, which the dress was actually really well made. And last but not least, we have Alonzo and what appears to be an H&M Zara sales rack situation that obviously does not fit. Now, if I had to give it to my worst dress, man, I'm going to go back with Will again. It just, I wasn't feeling it. It gave, you know, I'm trying too hard in the 70s. It gave trying too hard to be 80s drug dealer. Um, it just doesn't work for him in terms of that chain and that, that turtleneck. And I don't have a problem with the turtleneck with the, the, the suit, but the suit was not good. It wasn't a quality suit that the turtleneck would match with it. And that chain takes away from so much of making him look like an adult. He looks like Meat Mill. <laughs> it's so bad. And I know, you know, up top, he's trying to give Fly, GQ. It gave Diddy, okay? It gave, why Why do we have this on? It, it was very confusing. The chain is annoying. I didn't know if it spun. I didn't know what was happening. I really hate that he is already very young and immature, but the, the energy of that does not help when he dresses like a toddler. I did not and do not understand the chain with the house on it. And why is it necessary for the purposes of this show? But he was absolutely my worst dress. And that's saying a lot because Chaz looked unhoused. Now, my worst dress woman was Alexis. And again, it's always the same thing for me with her when it comes to her wardrobe. It just makes her look like a kid. Alexis is a slim woman. She has a very um, slender frame. Nothing wrong with that. She's not the girl that has like super, super curves, but she has, you know, gorgeous hair. She has, she does have a bit of a curve and she has a femininity to her where she's not trying to box people every five minutes. Um, but I feel like she just lost the, the, the plot with this outfit and we're going to get into spinning the stack, <laughs> but this hot pink like mess of a dress was so uncomfortable to me. It gave my first prom. I do not understand all of the multiple designs that were going on in the outfit, plus the gloves. Um, it just didn't work to me for her. I also don't think that it's a good idea for her to wear her hair pulled back. I just, I feel like it just made her look even slimmer. And with the dress being kind of streamlined, I feel like that's when your hair should be a bit bigger. I feel like if you're having a large dress, like if you're going to have a gown, that's going to have like a big bottom at, the, at, at its base, then that's when I feel like you really should pull your hair back you refine that look a little bit more because the dress stands out so widely. But when you're slim and you're also wearing a dress that's going to like give you a little bit more of a silhouette, but it's going to be very slimming. She had a high slit on it. I don't know that the ponytail always works. Like I said, it gave um, Detroit prom and no shade to people in Detroit because they actually dress better than this. I feel like she was trying to go for a Marilyn Monroe vibe, you know, the whole diamonds are girl best friend, but it really gave more so, it gave even less so of Normani's version of diamonds are girl's best friend. It just, it gave cheap. It gave um, Insta dress and I hated it for her. I don't think it was great. And I also honestly don't feel like the color really, I don't know, maybe with the neon, the hot pink, it's just something about it that didn't work for me and that purple eye. Child boy, we're on the subject of Alexis in this horrible mess dress, honey. Let's get into, I paid a stack. I paid a stack. I spent the grip. Um, Ma'am, let's get into it. Alexis, I need you to pipe down, honey. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, at the end of this episode, honey, Alexis goes into a Jocelyn type vibe. You know what I'm saying? She's giving going off in a Tommy way. Shout out to Love, Love and Hip Hop. And she starts going off about incidences that happen at the end. But she needs to tell us in the camera how much she spent to be there and how they're wasting her time. And I just wanted to highlight um, what I think she was missing in that moment, which is understanding the difference about spending a grip, okay? Nothing about her outfits su su suggested to me that she spent a grip on anything, okay? The face was giving good drugstore, you know, YouTuber, 
<laughs> it was it was not giving high end. It very much gave Mac makeup counter. The dress was not giving high end. So spending a grip, she got ripped off. I did not know what was going on. I said, what was it? What in what currency was it a was it a grip? And what currency was it a stack, honey? Was it Nigerian Nara? <laughs> like, is that what you're saying? Is it just a different currency? We not understand that you really spent less than that because it gave makeshift prom. Okay. It gave very much like my friend Jarrell go to fashion school and he hooked me up. Um, it did none of it gave high end. So I didn't understand spending a grip. The hair gave my sister Keisha is in hair school or, you know, local hair, beauty supply, and the lady that braided down the street. It did not give super high end. Like I said, her hair didn't look crazy to me, but spending a grip, we have to be honest. Like I think sometimes people on TV, they forget that we have TV. I don't know how y'all felt about it. Y'all let me know in the comments, but I definitely felt like there was a clarity about spending the grip. When I'm giving a showcase of this, I'm talking about, we see this on a regular basis, honey. This is, reunions aren't new to us. So when you're talking about spending the grip, I need you to be looking like a Porsche, like a Marlo, like a Kenya, like a Monique. I need you to be looking like the fabulous women on all the other Real Housewives shows or even just serving us a look that looked a little bit more regal and high end. That did not give that. And that's spending a grip. That's when we know you spent a couple thousand dollars, which you do not have to do, by the way. This is a reunion. You're on here for ready to love. You didn't even meet no damn body. She could have showed up with the same outfit that Will had on. It wouldn't have made a difference. But I feel like such the yelling in the camera, it gave it gave slight mismanagement of stuff. But I feel like we know what spending the grip looked like. And that pink monstrosity, wasn't it? Let's move on to fashion and get into this episode, Jow. So despite all of the she in mixing with the AliExpress vibes, along with David's bridal, it feels like this season and this episode was specifically meant to give us Jerry Spring alive. When I tell you that the ratchetness started and it never stopped for the entire hour, I do not know what Owen was thinking. At this point, I think they have actually given up on the love aspect. They knew they had nothing to serve us. They knew they couldn't BS us for the rest of the season. So let's get into, you know, all of the mess that took place, honey. They did a quick flashback of where they were back to what it was going to be, which was a whole bunch of nonsense. Child, so let's get into Krishan Sr., a.k.a. Patrice, and Alonzo, a.k.a. Steve Urkel. Can I call your rose? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not, but we can't call Alonzo a liar. So Tommy immediately gets into the get down and tries to find out. Let's get to our first couple. He shows a little love story that happened between Patrice and all the little connections she had and tried to force into the situation um, to try to make it to the end with her son. I have told y'all from the beginning that this was very much giving mother-son complexes. It was definitely giving a weird vibe to me in terms of how Alonzo interacted with her from the beginning. I felt like she was a very nurturing spirit, but she also was a pick-me throughout the entire season, which is how she didn't see the other things with him. I thought at some point he was showing a level of maturity, but he did always have a goofy-like energy about him. And I do mean goofy instant Disney. Um, that never really sat well with me. It was too Willy Wonka for me. And I always felt like he was going to end up being the jackass and I served right. So Patrice begins to tell us about how, you know, right after the situation, Alonzo gave her a key to his place, honey. He said, you can come on in. And, you know, three days later, she showed up to his house using said key to find him with somebody else, okay? Alonzo then gets into trying to explain himself. And Patrice says, you know, she wants to be able to get a chance to talk. So he goes into this rant about how she's overthinking it and the person was just a friend and, you know, this young lady was somebody that he knew from his past that she's just a friend and his Jeep broke down, okay? <laughs> Who raised your hand if you thought Alonzo didn't have a car? Because I didn't. Uh, and, you know, she's, he says that, you know, the friend helped him out and he went to go get groceries and that's the whole situation. That's how somebody's at his house. He gives his long song and dance, honey. Nobody in the group is believing it, let alone us at home. And Patrice proceeds to say, can I finish? Because there's more. And at that point, Alexis did what we was all going to do and leaned in. <laughs> that was one of her funnier moments before it went to Jocelyn level. You know what I'm saying? Before it went to Puerto Rican Princess High. It was still very much hilarious to watch us lean into the story because Patrice then proceeds to tell us that essentially Alonzo, while telling us that story, is full of it. 
because she met up with the girl. And when she met up with the girl, the girl let her know that Alonzo and her had just had sex a month before. Alonzo goes, yeah, we had sex. <laughs> to which Tommy turns around and goes, fool, you just told her she was just a friend. Clearly she's not. Okay. Oh, baby, you, you got what I need. Essentially, she's some girl that he was sleeping with multiple times before then. And Patrice says that that's what the woman laid out to her. She also was like, this is ridiculous. Like, he's a liar. I'm just disappointed in the situation. Alonzo then goes on to say that it's pissed, he's pissed off that he can't have a friend. And everybody else is saying, like, it's not that you can't have a friend, but why would you, you cannot be friends with this person while you're pursuing somebody else that you slept with. You obviously had an intimate relationship with this woman that was in a that was inappropriate to bring into this new situation. He goes on to say, well, you know, I don't understand how you, you so you can't be friends with anybody that you used to mess with and y'all don't have that going on. If she knows what it is, but sir, she clearly doesn't know because she met up with Patrice to let her know that less than a month before that y'all was knocking. Okay. The boots all over your one bedroom. And so Patrice goes, but it goes deeper. <laughs> Everybody is appalled on the right side of the room. Do you understand what I'm saying? At this point, Tommy has switched back and forth between his white pants and he don't know what to do. And Patrice lets us know that there were also three other women that he was messing with at that time. He was having multiple sex with, with the different women and he was also getting STD tested, I guess, to make sure he didn't give her nothing or catch nothing before the end of the season. Who knew Alonzo had as many people interested in him? Everything about him from this show gives doopy it gives not bright i i would not be attracted to this so i don't know if he's i don't know if these women i need to see how these girls look because he gives me he's tricking them i don't understand or paying for prostitution i don't know either way patrice is disappointed in the situation they uh i don't know tommy asks us, i guess out of just a need to know but he says like do you ever see it working out Patrice is like once somebody show you who they really are believe them she said there would be a chance in hell that him and i would ever be an item she just feels pissed off because she wasted so much time trying to give him a chance um, and also raise him. Because again, I always gave him the son from the very beginning. Um, and she just feels like she wasted her experience to a certain degree. And I couldn't agree more. Now let's get into little Willie getting jiggy with it. <laughs> because that seems to be the topic of discussion when it comes to Will 1.0. And this whole narrative around whether he was homeless, living in his car, whatever the situation may be. Um, and how much money he got. So Tommy starts to discuss how Will, you know, came up in the ladies' lounge and throughout the beginning parts of the show, you know, as somebody who had made some of the ladies uncomfortable and they had mentioned it. So on the couch is Will and Patrice sitting next to each other. And Patrice is, un, you know, she's untethered to the situation, honey. When I tell you she's in her own world, still steaming and wanting to choke out Alonzo, that's where her energy was. And on the other side, they have Alexis, uh koshia and mika sitting with each other and so tommy starts to ask like you know where does he where do they think everything went wrong so will says you know so tommy asks well how you feel you know i'm blessed i'm feeling good tommy uh you know i i i i, I <laughs> you know he starts talking like i turn <laughs> i feel blessed you know I, I i got some properties i got some things in my name you know no no, no. you're saying i'm good i'm fine you know no, no. but the name belonged to me <laughs> that's how fast he was talking about nonsense but he essentially says that he's fine, he's good, he's blessed, he's in good health. Nothing about this show has phased him. But clearly that's not the case, sir. You were bothered when you were there last time because you were on one when you thought that you were going to be eliminating all these different people going home after you find out what they said from Alexis. But he's pretending to be unbothered in this moment, in this space, and, you know, dressed like Isaac Hayes, I guess, you know, we're set to believe that. So he starts talking about how he doesn't understand how they determine that because when he was staying at the house he was staying at, he was saying something about how he was a real estate developer and ultimately he owned several properties and one of the properties was being staged or he was removing the staging from one of the properties. And essentially that's why I look like he didn't have any furniture at the house. So he doesn't understand where that was coming from. They don't know his money. Now Mika in the middle begins to say, well, we don't know you. We don't know that about you. We don't know anything about you. So when you're presenting yourself for the first time to us, we don't know this information. He's like, well, I don't know you. Who are you? I think he wasn't listening to what she was saying initially because she was just saying, we don't know that about you. So how you present yourself the first time, how you come off when you got to tell us everything that you're doing financially, you know, versus just saying, hey, I'm a real estate developer. I've been doing it for a while. There was something I'm really passionate about. There's a difference between that. You know, I got 600 something in assets and all that kind of stuff. That's what's not impressive to anybody. And that's man or woman. If you're in a conversation with a woman 
getting to know her, whether it's a partner situation or you get to know somebody romantically, it's not attractive for you to pull your resume down immediately. You know what I'm saying? Like, no man is trying to hear that. I don't want to hear about your resume and all of that. I want you to tell me what you do for a living, maybe why you're passionate about it, but that's it. And that's what Will was doing. He gives young energy because he is young. And it shows in how he interacts and reacts with them. So him and Mika getting this back and forth about how, you know, she doesn't need to know what he has on and, and, and what he's wearing. And he doesn't need to know what she's doing. You don't know how much money I have. And you know what I'm saying? Like, and she's like, well, we don't even care. She said, I don't even care to look it up. And he's like, I don't care to look it up with you. You were single mama with two kids. It was just all over the place. And of course, they go back to the confessional room <laughs> to April and Rashina. And they're like, oh, how did we get here? As we as an audience are. And so they go back into this back and forth again. Tommy shuts it down. And then they sort of ask, you know, how did things go left with him um, and Koshia? And Koshia says, no, 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 I'm sorry. I think we go over to him and Patrice. Now, T Tommy says, well, okay, uh, from what I understand with staging, you know, normally it's so that the house looks a certain way. So he says, Patrice, now that you know that information, <laughs> um, you know, do you feel differently? Would you have made a different thing? Because he said, Will, we obviously know Will went on this manhunt that day at the party. He was zoned in once Alexis talked to him about trying to find out who said it. And Patrice goes, well, no, I, you know, I feel like I said the right thing at the time when I talked to him, he made it seem as if he had taken everything out the home. And like, she was like, so where's he going to be sleeping? Is he going to be sleeping on the countertop? He's going to be sleeping on the floor. Because if you don't have any furniture in the house, then you saying you stand at the house. Are you sleeping in a sleeping bag? Like, talk to me. I don't think what Patrice said was out of line. She wasn't she questioned stability because, one, we're in a staging home. I guess he said he moved out of his house and was living in the staging house. Um, to me, again, this is different for everyone. But as a successful real estate developer, you don't need to live in your staging house. Um, but I guess he was trying to say he moved out of his place. It gives, it gives you might be managing, but you might not be a developer. Now, I'm going to say this. I want to check it out to see what Alexis was saying. No, I'm sorry. What um, Will was saying and what Mika was saying about him being a scammer might be true. I have to say, seeing his Instagram page, it gives scam vibes. Everything about it gives 4X energy. Um, it gives, I jumped from business to business, which actually I saw that, you know, maybe three or four years ago, he was actually a financial consultant. Um, now, maybe that financial money was what brought him here, or he's just a person that starts these viral businesses that don't uh, think i did see that he was selling a course on how to be a real estate developer it gives the vibes of what we see now with the black community so much when you talk about like people who are like giving you the facade of success like they have the instagram page they have the whatever but you don't there's parts of it that are missing and let me say this as a working professional myself, I know other working professionals. I went to college with other working professionals. We graduated. People went to grad school, from medical school, all kinds of stuff. Um, and you know, I know some real estate. Uh, I know some real estate agents. I know a broker. Um, I have a friend who went. To his parents. His parents actually met in college. They are real estate developers in Georgia. Um, and he moved back to Georgia once he graduated. So he moved from the East Coast to the South. And he now works for them. And so the whole family is in the development game and they've developed properties within Georgia. And I actually saw one of your properties featured on another show, but they really do this for real. And they don't have like a large Instagram following. They don't have like a large page of like their personal successes in terms of like non-real estate development. That page if they have one probably online and what I've seen from other real estate developers who are very serious in that game is focus on that development. They're not showing Rolls Royce they, they wore. They're not showing outfits that they have on. They're not showing personal cars. They're not showing anything about their personal wealth. That page is focused on that business because really serious people come to that page, right? So we have people that want to develop properties, townhomes, multifamily units. They want to develop commercial properties. Like they do commercial real estate and they do residential development. And it's a really serious business. Even And so you're not posting your personal life on that type of stuff. They're also people who don't, they don't sell a course. They do this in real life. They were real estate developers for a really long time. I think both in Georgia and Chicago. So they have real estate experience. The people that they have on um, their website, they also have like events that they've shown with video where they have them at real estate functions. So serious people in real estate actually know who they are because they've, they've worked as realtors for a long time and then brokerage. Like they've, they've had the steps. 
So then you'll see people like that normally at real estate events, they're at functions, they have to do with realty and their business. They're not interested in functions unless you work in that industry. They know construction folks. It's, and other people in those industries know them as well. So I want to know if anybody from Dallas ever met Will, if you work in real estate. Have you run into him? Has he built a house that you know? Or is he managing? I don't know. I'm happy for success if the brother has it. Absolutely kudos to him. But he gave 4X energy, so I don't know if Mika was completely wrong. They move over to Koshia, and Koshia begins to explain that she doesn't have beef with Will based on all of this real estate stuff. Her issue came in when they had their first conversation, which Will was very disrespectful in that first conversation when he talked to her. As she was being vulnerable about a moment where she didn't make the best choice and he was asking about her life and she was giving that to him and he still asked for her number after but she said that it came in the fact that will was too thirsty and he was thirsty with all of the women he wanted to give his number to all of the ladies it was very corny it was very college energy it was very early frat boy energy and so he ended up she said that so that's what turned me off about him but it wasn't that and she said even though i felt uncomfortable I still never blamed him fully. She said that I was my responsibility to let him know that he did not make me feel comfortable in the thing that he said. And I had no problem doing that, but I never got to talk to him because here go Alexis japping her mouth. And show sure enough, here come Alexis back to my I never talked to him. Da, 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 da. Now, I can tell you this. When Koshia was explaining that, Will felt like a jackass at that moment. When she was saying what she was saying, he had no comeback for that because he probably didn't even realize that that's what occurred. And so I think whatever heat he came to bring with her because he was already in it with Mika, he didn't bring that heat to, to Koshia because he didn't know that she was saying like, hey, I don't fully blame you. I should have talked with you, but I didn't even get a chance to because your homegirl was so hyped to try to be on your side. Then they get into it where, you know, Alexis got to work herself in this situation, arguing with Koshia, honey. It was just weird energy. Tommy eventually says like, black people, this is embarrassing. Uh, the segment ends. Nothing's really resolved. We care even less about this. Mika said the people that got eliminated first had the most to say. She basically said she still don't trust Will. And the fact that he was so thirsty to let us know all of the things that he's acquired and the assets he has makes you believe less that he has them. I feel like that's true and not true. Yes, there is such a thing as, you know, quiet wealth. But there are also people who are very wealthy who are just tacky. And perhaps Will is one of those people I don't know. We'll have to see three or four years from now. He took out a PPP loan and we're going to see him on TV. I have no idea. Honey, now let's talk about a ghost named Glenn, honey, because that was one of the prime things that was shocking for all of us to see. So as you know, the very first mixer that they had, you know, this was broken up into two different parts, honey. They had a set of people that were supposed to come. And it was supposed to be, I think, t five women, five men. So 10 people on one and 10 people on the other. And then one person, I think, from each side was supposed to be eliminated that night or one person. But our boy Glenn got to the gate and didn't show <laughs> and wouldn't get out the car. So finally, Glenn is revealed to everybody because nobody met Glenn. We just saw him on screen. And besides production, nobody even know he existed. <laughs> LeBron said several times, bro, I thought you was <laughs> I thought you was a phantom situation. I really didn't even think you existed. And they showed a clip when everybody was like, is Glenn real? Like, remember Tommy kept calling Glenn on the phone multiple times? Um, so eventually Glenn walks through. And Glenn is dressed in a nice little brown outfit, got a cute enough little look going on, you know, nice disposition, cool. And Glenn is revealed to everybody as being a real person. The ladies are not mad at what they've seen because this season has been full of shenanigans and ridiculousness. The quality has not been there, maybe on both sides, but specifically on the male side of things, it's just been disappointing. And so Glenn is a nice, fresh, tall drink of water. And Tommy gets into, hey, Glenn, like what happened with your situation? And Glenn goes on to say that he took his son to school that morning and then he got into a wreck they ask glenn why he's looking for love they go back to his old clip he says something really sweet and romantic about how much time we have and you know you got to find somebody that you love and the ladies are softened by that energy they also think that he's very cute even the women in the back and glenn also explains that he has a bit of anxiety and so this is an anxiety ridden process to put all yourself yourself on television and be vulnerable in this way and ultimately, you know, he said that, that even right now he's very nervous and, you know, it is a little bit anxiety ridden. Um, but he's here and, um, you know, he's open to still finding love. And then they talked to Justin on the far end because Justin ended up being the replacement for Glenn when he didn't show up. 
And I told you that before, like before Ready to Love. Remember, um, in Houston, Liz was a was a shoe in for somebody who didn't show up either. So you never know how that can work out in your favor. Liz ended up making this to the end with Jason. We know that that ended up falling apart because it was trash uh, on Jason's end. But look how you could just be the standby and they call you up. So um, Justin talks about how, you know, he was nervous. He understands what Glenn was going through because he was also nervous in the process. And he felt like he was kind of late, but he appreciated the warmth that he got from everybody and that, you know, everybody ends up being really cool. All the men on the women. And ultimately, he found his he found somebody else. And I love how they went to the background to Rashina and April, who were given the best commentary of the whole night. And Rashina was like, "That's because baby found love." <laughs> I love Rashina. I really hope from this process, she gives me a lot of positive energy. She gives me Dakia from DC, and I really, really hope she finds love because she gives me girls' girl. And the fact that she's rooting for Justin and mika and wasn't a hater when it was clear that they had a connection is why i think she's going to be successful in finding her person so i'm really rooting for rashina y'all y'all let me know what y'all think about glenn i mean glenn was you know he's cute and tommy feels like he should still have a chance so he lets him know that they're gonna let him do a little speed dating during the reunion with all of the ladies who did not find love which is pretty much everybody and let them know how it all works out and maybe he will leave with somebody or at least a phone number honey at best maybe he'll meet somebody he won't go ghost on okay y'all so before we get into Leyland, who i think was mostly a class act i want to talk a little bit about what wasn't a class act did y'all notice how during the segment when glenn is talking about the fact that he got into a wreck alexis is in the background when they go into the back and she's yelling out how she doesn't believe him and how school was summertime so how could he be taking his son to school and everybody is looking at her like girl shut the hell up and then, you know, ultimately when Glenn goes back to start his dating rounds, he starts off with Alexis and she tells him like, well, I don't believe your story about you taking your son and getting in a car wreck. So you got to give me something better than that. And Glenn <laughs> moves away from her in the smoothest way possible. He like, oh, your drink look a little bit empty. Let me go fill that up for you. And he goes, oh, y'all got Pringles. <laughs> when I tell you that man could not get away fast enough. It's like the immaturity keeps showing up for her. No matter how she tried to feel so sophisticated during the season, there's obviously pieces of her that the maturity is just not there. And much like Will, it shows up. They a perfect match. I don't even know why they're not dating. Um, because they bring the perfect level of jackassery to the situation. So I'm not really sure why her and Will are not an item. But um, Glenn is clearly not interested and he moves on and starts speaking to April. So she got a little bit more common sense. So fast forward in the front, and when we come back for commercial, they are on to our girl, Leilin. Now, you know, Leilin left the situation because she had a family situation going on at home that was a lot more serious, and she had to leave. I think it was involving her dad. I'm glad to know that he's okay. It sounds like that's the case because they're showing the segment, and she said that it's kind of emotional for her to watch. Um, but she's he, Tommy asked her, is everything okay? And she said that it was, which I'm really happy to hear. And then he talks to her about the fact that she missed the process. And she says that she's really sad that she missed the process. I don't believe that at all. Um, but she seems like the type that will always say the right thing. Um, and so he says, you know, she said she, she did have some connections and she really wished she had worked them through. Girl, you really watched this show at home. You really heard about the segments of things that were going on and you still decided that you wanted to be here. And I realized at this point, they don't watch the show at home just yet. The reunion happens before this even airs. So, um, Poor soul, Leilin did not realize that she missed nothing, okay? You exited at the right time, okay? It was the Lord pulling you out of the situation so you could have some common sense. And I know that she had some common sense because then Tommy says, well, you know, since you weren't a part of the entire process and, you know, one of your strongest connections with Chaz, you know, Chaz tries to chime in on some, you know, I was, she was my strongest connection and, you know, you know, I, she was my first connection and this and that. And so Tommy says, well, is there a chance? And she goes, you know, I'm dating. <laughs> The way in which that lady tap danced backwards to make sure that she could not be linked to any man in this show or probably to this show was a feat to see. She's like, oh, you know, I feel like my person is out there, but it's not in this room. <laughs> Can we also talk about the fact, though, that despite, you know, I don't want to, I think Leyland is beautiful. I, you know, being of a certain age and not being married or not having a partner doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. But it's just me or do Leilin give a little Brandy Webb vibes? Probably give a little Lynn Whitfield from Thin Line Between Love and Hate for me. I don't know. It's like a, 
something about it feels like I'm very much classy, but I also have a little bit of crazy bitch. Y'all let me know what y'all think in the comments. It's just us having fun, but honestly, it's a little something that made me look like we are getting a full version of a grown woman, granted, but there's that slice of her that might be like, if you cross me, <laughs> basically don't tell her I love you. Otherwise, if you don't really mean it. <laughs> Child, so we get back to Alonzo. Once again, they have bought Steve Urkel out here trying to become Steve Urkel, trying to over-explain this situation about how he didn't disrespect Coach Shia, honey. So we get into this conversation about how it was inappropriate as hell as it was for uh, Alonzo to talk to Coach Shia about, um, you know, sexual stuff very early on. They showed a segment, obviously, when him and Coach Shia were having a conversation and she walked out because he asked her about does she like choking versus spanking? And it was on the phone and she automatically hung up from that. But when they met up to talk about it, he tried to gaslight her into saying that that wasn't a sexual um, innuendo. And ultimately he was just trying to ask that question. So of course he get back to the segment and nobody, and I mean, nobody believed that. And nobody believed the situation about, you know, him saying it wasn't a sexual connotation. And Tommy is like, what in the world? What, like, where would that ever come from? He goes, well, here's how it works. You could be kissing somebody and choking them. And Tommy's like, I've been married for X amount of years, 30, 45, 50 years at this point. I ain't never choked my wife <laughs> and kissed her at the same time. And so he's like, well, some people do. It depends on the situation in the world. Alonzo, stop playing in our face. We know you don't already gaslit Patrice beyond belief. And again, it was uncomfortable. Koshia like walked out of that experience because he tried to play her in front of the cameras on screen. And then he tried to play on her top here as well as everybody else's about the difference between choking and uh, spanking and whether or not that was a, a appropriate uh, way to speak to her. It just was crazy to me how he kept acting like a jackass and they kept entertaining it. Um, you know, ultimately nothing was solved in this segment. Koshia goes on to say that, you know, she wasn't interested in him and that that's the thing that was never going to be approached. So she says that, you know, it's under your business. I wasn't attracted to you in that way. This was very, very early on. She said that there were two other men. She mentions both LeBron and Chaz, who she was consistently talking to and having those types of conversations. They were her two connections and they knew about that because they had, they had gotten to that level where they were having those types of conversations, probably just in jest or whatever. Um, and she was comfortable talking with them because she was into them and she was not into him. She further lets us know that them locks, it was never going to be a thing for her. Um, Patrice doesn't chime in the way she did with Leilin about, you know, you want to get with him because he gets with everybody. You know, she was still a little upset, I think, a little residue from this situation. And we move on to the next segment, honey. So in the next segment, Tommy decides that he liked the way that they were playing the game, that they had been playing the entire time, that they have been... Um, the, well, both times they had both they had both played a set of games in terms of getting to know people. And he loved the games throughout the season. He thought it was really fun. And obviously the whole setup this season of them, you know, interchanging and having these different moments, he felt like, let's play a little game right now. This was a bad idea. <laughs> so time begins to segment to ask, like, who said it? That's the name of the game. Who said this line based on the season? Everybody gets a chance to guess except for Glenn Honey that left him in the back of the room. And they check on Glenn, and Glenn has still been making his rotation with the ladies. So I guess we'll see at the end of next episode who he has chosen, if he connected with anybody, honey, or Glenn got a wife at home. <laughs> and so they start asking questions. They get into a question that Chaz might have asked. They get into something, and they find out that Rashina has asked it. And they get into another segment, and they find out like somebody else asked the question. Well, there comes up the topic of the snake situation. And remember that LaRon had said that they were a whole bunch of snakes and it was this old covert operation to get Koshia out the house and systematically people like Will 1.0 and Will 2.0 and Alexis had kind of teamed up to be able to eliminate people from the house and they had a whole plan ready. And so they, somebody mentions how they think somebody is a snake in the house and, and so La, it's about LaRon and LaRon says that he automatically thinks that it was Alexis, because he had, you know, beef for her and the whole snake thing came from there. But Alexis goes, I'm me. Like, why would it be me? She says, oh, well, I, it's, you know, it's not me. But so he moves on to the next person. Said, well, if it's not you, then I think it's Dom. Turns out it was, you know, it was Will 
uh, 2.0, not uh, not uh, Isaac Hayes Jr. So Alexa goes, well, wait a minute. What are you saying it was me? Why would you say it was me? I don't understand that. That would mean that um, I was saying that you were a snake. And I do think that you're, you're the biggest snake in this house. And so everybody goes like, oh, I can't believe she just said that. And it turns into a whole other thing where it gets a little out of hand. So I don't even know how we went from sugar to shit this quick. When I tell you the escalation of this last part of the episode was crazy. So while they're going back and forth, you know, she starts calling him a dork. He's like, well, how are you going to talk about a dork? You got a cubic zirconia on. It's a back and forth. You know, they start grating at each other. It was very much giving Samuel Jackson, Halle Berry fighting over that crack pipe. It was, it was, it really was just a wild situation. Mind you, everybody else is just starting to get uncomfortable. Production is like, hey, we got to bring it back. Tommy has less lost complete control of the show at this point they now kill the segment and start going like hey we got to calm down we calm down you know it's a problem when alonzo was the only one making common sense at the moment honey when i tell you he was like let's bring it back let's bring it back let's bring it back he's trying to you know snap her out of the situation you know alexis is getting increasingly upset production comes out to sort of stand in between them although they're not really leaning towards each other you know she's yelling at laron laron is like yelling at her and Alonzo, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Alonzo even gets up. And this is the only thing I don't understand. Will 1.0, her bestie, okay, the, the saucy Santana to her Carisha, did not even step in at any point to get his friend out in the initial part of it. It was, in fact, Alonzo that got up and said, let's switch seats. Because that's what he was trying to do. And I feel like she should have listened to that. I applaud him for being the only grown man there to say, you know what? Let's just go ahead and switch seats so we could change it up a little bit. Because at one point, Tommy just exited his seats and said, look, don't call me back on here so they got it together. <laughs> but he tried to switch seats with Alexa and said, hey, why don't you get up? You don't have to leave. She's like, I'm not leaving. I'm not going. He's like, look, I'm just saying, like, let's like, go sit over next to her and then we could sit and we could finish the segment. So everybody's pissed off because Alexis won't shut up. LeBron is like, well, how are you going to tell me to leave? You're not asking her to leave. Production is trying to keep them at bay. And then they're like, will you please be quiet, honey? So they keep going at it and she's getting yappier and yappier. It's giving um, like the tiny yappy dogs. It's giving chihuahua. <laughs> and so she's continuing to go at it with him. Production has now, like I said, killed the segment. Tommy done walked off the set, honey, with a whole bunch of other folks. The rest of them are still sitting there. Alexis is going in further and further. Justin is sitting next to her and says, like, look, you need to be quiet. You need to kind of, can y'all shut the up? But he was saying it to both of them at first. LaRon is like, I'm quiet. I'm good. Like, she's the one that keeps going at it. I didn't say anything. She said something to me. And she's like, hi, you want to say that? So then Justin said, but you have to you have, you have to learn to be quiet. And she's like, well, why do I have to be quiet? And she's like, so she starts going at it with Justin. Now, I'm going to say this. Whether I care for Alexis or not, I mean, I don't really have any affinity for anybody on the show. Um, I do feel like the conversation that started to happen with Justin was a bit uncomfortable to me. And it wasn't all Alexis's fault. The way he was engaging with her initially, because what he said jarred her when she said that it wasn't her fault that she was arguing with LeBron. And he said something about you don't know how to shut up or whatever. And she said she got up. She clearly was upset at that moment. And she was saying like, who me? Like, what are you saying when saying that? But she's still in her loud voice, but she wasn't screaming at him. And the way he engaged with her after that, it was a little angry and a little bit like, you need to learn to shut the fuck up and talking to her that kind of way. I was not comfortable with that. Y'all let me know shut up in the comments. I know she was getting a little whatever, but some of his engagement with her was weird. And I didn't like that exchange. And he's like, I know how to shut the F up. And look, I'm doing it now. I'm doing it now. It was just was weird. Like at that point, sir, nobody was asking you to be production. You were not talking her down. You clearly were already in your feelings about the fact that her and Mika didn't get along, which is cool. I understand. I, you know, you don't get along with my girl. I don't get along with you. But then exit stage left. Don't keep engaging her because you weren't de-escalating anything and you were getting more hyped up. And what I would hope would never happen is nobody would try to put their hands on her. She put her hands on them. Uh, we can we can dislike each other verbally. Shout out to Lamar. <laughs> Who kept it cool as a cucumber. Um. Anyway, it gets really weird. At that point, they're trying to get everybody off the set. They're walking off. They're trying to get everybody. LeBron is still out there, honey. <laughs> and his bus driver best um, with his jacket off now. Will 1.0 finally walks over to try to help the situation somewhat. And it's crazy to me because when Alexis kept calling him a dork, and then I'm talking about LeBron, back and forth, Will goes, oh, this dude is a clown. But he never said it to LeBron face, and he certainly didn't say it when he got over there. Because I think LeBron took that jacket off for Will 1.0. 
And Will gets over there, tries to de-escalate the situation for him and his homegirl. And she tells him to get off of her. That's when it got real, real weird. And she goes into Tommy mode, you know, completely sees red. She then turns around to Mika, who is talking to production, who never touched her, who never walked up on her to say, you you know, disrespected her. She literally said to production, hey, can you come get her because she's not going to stop? She said it in the calmest way possible. She was talking to production as they're coming to the side. And I think what she was doing is trying to tell them to come get her because at this point, she's starting to get into it with Justin and is getting to an uncomfortable experience. And so Mika's like, look, she's not going to stop going at it. And I don't think that that's going to make him feel whatever. She swivels. And by she, I mean Alexis, and turns around and says, and bitch, you da, 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 to Mika. And that was it. Honey, Mika got a little bit louder, but she didn't really raise her voice. But Justin pops up. Like, who are you talking to? Who you? It was very weird. This was the most ghetto. <laughs> this was the most weird. Honestly, I feel like the level of energy that Alexis was given at this point gave for Halle Berry high on drugs. I don't know what was happening with that situation. It was an escalation that was weird. Um, it gave Jocelyn, but even Jocelyn only approached Benzino and them with Stevie. She was on her own getting dragged away and she was cursing out everybody from production to the other people on stage. She gets backstage. She starts screaming. She goes into the break room. She's like, I'll mess up everybody in here. I'm going to F this person up and this person. Then you can get it. Then you can get it. Then you can get it. <laughs> um, and she gets into the room. The green room, she's talking about how she spent the stack on her dress and how she got this and that. And she spent the stack on uh, to coming here and spent money coming here and spent the grip and they're not going to let her do whatever. It was the least classiest thing that she did outside of not closing her legs on stage earlier in the segment. We could see her entire beige shapewear. And she ends up going off. Will tries to pipe her down and says, well, can you at least go do the confessional? <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'm getting the L out of here. You're not going to keep going. Da, da, da. Now, I'm going to say this. In defense of Alexis, again, I will say that when everybody was sort of surrounding her, but it was mostly production, by the way, it wasn't really the rest of the group. They had already walked off stage out of embarrassment and just pure misunderstanding. It was hilarious to see Rashina and Leilin walk back with each other as they were leaving, talking about she had just shut up. I had not heard Leilin talk about that the entire season. She's like, oh, she had just shut up. We could finish the segment. <laughs> Honey, y'all done made Lynn Whitfield come out and say it was ridiculous. Alexis storms off in that prom dress, honey. Um, Will kind of walks behind her. She says she's not coming back. This is ridiculous. They could kiss her A and walks on out. And that is the end of the episode. We got a part two coming up with some new information, including what's going on with Mika and Justin, as well as probably addressing the Maya and LeBron situation. Y'all let me know what y'all think of this episode. Let me know what y'all thought of this season. Did you like it? Was this ready to love? Was this just ready to fight? It gave WWE more to me than it gave Love is Blind. But let me know that in the comments and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye.